Namaste. Welcome, friends. Today, I'm having a conversation with uh, Locke Kelly, who's a friend, a psychotherapist, highly respected and popular meditation teacher, and for very good reason. Uh, Locke guides in what he calls effortless mindfulness. And it brings a very real, non-dual depth and aliveness to the path of awakening. Um, he's written several books on it and recently came out with an app that I tried out and found really, really good. So highly recommend. So our conversation is a rich one and I hope you enjoy. Hi and welcome everyone. It's my great pleasure today to be here dialoguing with my friend and colleague, Tara Brock. Welcome, Tara. I feel really delighted to be with you, Locke. Yes, so so wonderful to have a chance, uh, you know, with all the busy schedules to dive deeply into things that we both uh, love and are kind of have a vision to share with others, and now we can share together and while others listen. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, it's my idea of a good Dharma party. <laughs> <laughs> yes, that's right. This is this is what I love. So, um, yeah, I know that uh, you know. You just whenever I get a chance to hear you and what you're doing, um, I get um, natural sympathetic joy. <laughs> <laughs> so it's like, oh, effortless sympathetic joy arising because yeah, go Tara, go. You know, cause oh, it feels... well, I'm glad I'm serving in that way. <laughs> and it's mutual, of course. I feel like we've been tracking each other for a good number of years. Yeah, yeah. So I just wanted to start with that just to say that it's it's a delight. And um, uh, just to begin, you know, by talking a little about, uh, I noticed that uh, your book, which I am rereading, Radical, Radical Acceptance, published about 20 years ago. But as I read it, it was like, oh, it's almost like it's your new book, because it's it's literally the themes are what we're both still talking about and almost are still cutting edge. So I just thought, I wondered, like, as you kind of look at it today, what's, you know, what's new, what's the same, what is kind of the core of, of what you were communicating then that's fresh now? Oh, thank you for that invitation. Yeah, so 20th anniversary edition, and it's got, you know, a new chapter and a new forward and uh, introducing the rain meditation and so on. And I wanted to do do this. I wanted to have the chance to bring it forward again. Um, it feels like this is such a time of... Um, Ident, you know, just getting divided, the dividedness, the hostility, the contempt, and and it's it's amongst so many of us. I feel myself going into that kind of dividedness and demoting others in my mind because of their views, and it just felt so important. It feels like the only healing for these times is waking up consciousness, awake awareness, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. and an awake heart, and so. I wanted to really make it fully relevant to these times, including our identities, how we get caught in social identities and don't see each mm -hmm. other, we yes. really don't see who's there, and including, uh, you know, how we forget our belonging to this larger living planet and uh, don't navigate in a way that's sensitive and conscious. So. It felt the time, radical acceptance basically means mm. to completely allow, without any resistance or opposition, the experience that's unfolding. And in that allowing, we open to a presence that has the kind of intelligence and compassion that can respond. So it's not passive, mm -hmm. you know, it, mm -hmm. it's actually the grounds for activism, but more spiritually rooted activism. Yeah. So so thank you for inviting that out because I'm <clears throat> excited to bring consciousness practices into the world that mm -hmm. are so linked to what is going on right now. Yeah. Yeah, as you say it's uh, you know as social animals 
you know, there is a tendency to want to be part of a group and to bond, but then that connection that keeps us in the more family or smaller sense and creates this otherness that <clears throat> makes us feel that that movement to the bigger we to the to the global family um is is what's needed by but not just through politics or actions or but also through transformation of consciousness which is really seeing that we are the same and that we're passionately no matter what the view is passionately feeling that we're protecting something valuable by trying to uh to hold a position about it i love the way you're framing it because i often think of the whole evolution of consciousness as waking up to that belonging you know mm. knowing that but it's not intellectual it has to be a felt sense that the life that's living through you the awareness that's looking through your eyes is completely the same and that that's what wakes up caring and it's interesting right before um we connected here i was reading an article in scientific american that has to do with um insects being sentient and having feelings feeling pain and joy and i feel like it takes really training our attention to wake up past some idea of a hierarchy where humans are better more worthwhile and between humans where different groups feel better are more worthwhile and it's very much part of our survival brain to actually make those differences to feel inferior and superior and yet we have this capacity to wake up out of that and in that takes to me a real dedication to sense this living world is sentient i mean that's a radical thing but when we actually feel it if yes. we look at a tree and there's a sense you know i have this mantra I'll say we are friends and then feel the uh -huh. realness of that yes you know, yeah beautiful yeah that everything you know, changes it does yeah and through that <clears throat> movement from like we often do <laughs> do like a research study and then some <clears throat> some you know great understanding or philosophy and then what's the practice to actually feel that rather than just think it or understand it or um <clears throat> repeat it because then it becomes a a, a kind of a a belief system rather than a lived um experience so um yeah there was there was a study um i think at dartmouth where they took groups of people that were all along the spectrum and flashed pictures of people similar and different and there would be visceral reactions of positivity and visceral reactions no matter what the how liberal or you know radical or of otherness that made people so it is this survival instinct as you say and it so it takes that acceptance of that not negating it or not saying it's bad to have that or we sh if we're spiritual we wouldn't feel that you know that's i think something you and i have in common it's like you know what we were human beings we got feelings we got emotions we got we got all the default you know settings and the first arrow that arises of you know uh anger or hatred is is just arising and it's you know the the response that is possible and the not only response but the compassion to that 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 changes uh and the and the type of compassion i think is you know we talk about i think that's the key because there's kind of <clears throat> levels of compassion or depth of you know meditative possibility of discovering you know what both you and i talk about is just you know being kind being compassionate uh attitude adjustment <laughs> positive thinking and then uh and then expression of that and then a kind of deep discovery of a natural compassion and a uh, a loving awareness or open-hearted presence or that we are the love yeah and 
than we can express or see through those eyes. Well, that's a, a powerful, beautiful way of describing both the capacity to cultivate compassion mm -hmm. and also the spontaneous compassion that arises when there's a wide open presence. Mm -hmm. And if we bring that to what we were just talking about, that we are wired to see difference, you know, mm -hmm. we're wired. Yes. And so to feel guilty, you know, I've, I've spent right. a lot of moments investigating white guilt, you know, mm -hmm. all the guilt for feeling, you know, I am responsible, I'm not doing enough to alleviate uh, the horror of, of racial mm -hmm. violence. Mm -hmm. And my own process, just to make it very personal, mm -hmm was just what you were describing, which was I had a face, and I'm, this is ongoing, this is not a uh, fait accompli, <laughs> but face the conditioning that, you know, my mind judged as really ugly and, and face it and feel the suffering of it, feel how it actually created separation. It, it, it imprisoned me and it made me not know my belonging to others. And it was when I felt the realness of that suffering that I'm putting my hand on my heart because I do that sometimes, that um, there was a tenderness and, and an acceptance of just as you said, this is just this is just this body mind's conditioning. But in that presence, there was a capacity to see beyond the ways that I had been creating separation. And and like you said, it takes practice. I, I have one uh, friend who described how he'd be on the subway and he'd notice himself in that classic, you know, making others other, the unreal other who's less than, and he would then meditate on the word thou. He would just sense them and sense spirit, sacredness, you know, the sentience living through them and just mentally whisper thou. And it dissolved that that separateness. And it's like the, the, the gift of bringing our attention to how we create separation, holding it with complete compassion, and then being able to see beyond and, and start to foster that sense of true belonging. I mean, we can't be alone on this planet if we truly know our belonging to, you know, the insects and the trees and those of different races and onward. And, and I guess I just keep coming back to there's motivation to do that because there's some deep part of our being, our already awake heart mind that really longs for that true belonging, not the yeah. belonging to a subgroup and feeling, you know, rah, rah, we're the best, but that yeah. true belonging, because that's the only way there's, you know, a truly fearless Hard and a loving heart is is knowing we're all that knowing that oneness. Yeah, beautiful. Yeah, the um, I just you just as you shared personally about your experience, I immediately kind of went back to going early on to Asia and being introduced in a kind of a deep way to meditation and starting in Sri Lanka, doing nine months of uh, vipassana and sight meditation both at the university and then doing, you know, five-day retreats, 10-day retreats, 21-day retreats, and <clears throat> then going up and having good fortune of meeting uh, Tibetan teacher Toku Ergen Rinpoche and kind of getting a, <clears throat> you know, a full, a full <laughs> introduction into from, you know, all the traditions, you know, having done some Zen before that and kind of feeling they all were connected. But I just remember after having a kind of initial uh, dropping into that meditative insight that's experiential, feeling like, well, do I want to be stay and be a monk? And I was like, no, I want to go back to New York City where people are suffering and finish, you know, do a social work degree and, you know, write into my family because that that's where that's where it feels like that you know, meditation and action leads to almost a, a kind of a, a playful, um, you know, joy of like, you know, we're all kids in a playground, but we're, everyone's innocent and suffering and a little bit crazy. <laughs> I love it. It's, it's 
the essence of the the bodhisattva path you know mm. the path of an awakening being is if you know you're belonging you know why leave the field of beings that we're all a part of mm. and that doesn't mean that we don't take as you did take real time in mm -hmm. uh, quiet yeah. contemplative retreat yeah. but there's something so beautiful and powerful about holding hands mm. and mm. and helping it's i i just think of aware the activity of awareness is love mm. and of course it gets confused and twisted and we have all the expressions in the world of uh, cruelty and ignorance but the the original impulse of of, mm -hmm. of awareness is love yes yeah that's that expression from its <clears throat> from its freedom and almost absence of neg negativity like non-judgmental almost neutral or free but then as that <clears throat> non-dual in the sense of the that pure awake <clears throat> awareness recognizes not other than aliveness when we drop deeply we go uh oh there's shame, you know, like, oh, there's guilt, oh, there's that memory, oh, I did all that, and I better, you know, oh, that person did it to me, we go out, we go in. But going, willing to go deeper and then include this, um, you know, with, with a real full on the cushion, off the cushion uh, way of, um, of, of being in the unfolding of, of this awakening which seems like it's the potential for just human development rather than some esoteric advanced you know olympic athlete thing i'm with you it feels like that <laughs> is the hope and you also are pointing to where the stuck place is and the suffering which is mm. um you know the activity of awareness is love it there's a basic goodness and so many people say, well, I can't find it. I don't trust yeah. it. If there's basic goodness, how come I feel hatred and anger? And it feels to me like one of the most powerful ways of deepening attention is to start realizing that every emotion is intelligent mm -hmm. and it gets torqued because we get caught in the sense of a separate self and get all identified and twisted and so on, kind of like a, like a hose that gets twisted and the water's not flowing through. But we can pay attention in a way that naturally untwists when instead of adding that second arrow that you described of, oh, this is bad mm -hmm. or I'm bad, mm -hmm. finding out deep down, right, really investigating those emotions, anger, and finding mm -hmm. Right embedded inside anger is an energy that is trying to, in some way, protect us, serve us, that anticipates mm -hmm. something is an obstacle to our unfolding. Mm -hmm. And if we can sense that, sense, I think of it as life loving life, that there's a life loving mm -hmm. life energy at the heart of every emotion. And then we can sense the way it got twisted, our awareness, because we're not judging is actually a healing attention that can untwist that hose and allow the waters to flow and actually get integrated in our whole body. So a lot of what I've been doing and working with people is when they're stuck saying, well, what's that part trying to do for you? And I yeah. know you have similar, uh, yeah. similar approaches because yeah. if we actually sense the fears trying to protect us, you know, if yeah. we sense that we can say thank you to the fear. I, I'm okay right now, but thank you. The relationship with that part shifts, and so there's some actual possibility of untwisting the fear and freeing up what's under it, which is a care about life. Yeah, yeah, beautiful. And, you know, with the different psychological and contemplative views we have, I mean, I think that's something we certainly have very much in common. You can, you can experience that that feeling or emotion in many different levels almost like eyeglasses or a microscope or electron microscope or then a a subpersonality or a persona or a so that 
we don't just kind of uh, spiritually zap it away with um, with awareness or mindfulness, as if it's just a story or just a thought or, you know, as one type of way of working with it. But as you say, it's almost like off the cushion, the way I find that emotions arise is sometimes they'll arise as natural emotion, rea natural emotional reaction, like, <clears throat> like a, you know, response to a loud sound, just, you know, kind of fear or, or initial anger will get triggered. But then often they form into thoughts, feelings, sensations, worldview, and kind of sneak up the back of, of one's head and then take over and get you know, feel like I'm possessed, and then adrenaline and cortisol goes into the body from there, so that it's like, well, this must be true, because it's embodied and happening now. So from here, what do I know? And what are the options? And then that, so in some ways, that what I call the mindful move, that first ability to, you know, to step back, or to pause, you know, or to uh, take a breath, but the breath leads to an openness, and then this other level of consciousness that is, you know, with, but not possessed, and then not staying in a detached witness, but finding a way, as you do with rain, to kind of then continue back um, to include and 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 have a felt sense of what exactly is this part that feels angry? Where is it in my body? And what is it saying? And what age is it even? Sometimes, but sometimes it's multiple ages, it's, but it's, it's got a view. And as soon as you realize that there are parts that you don't have to be egoless, you don't have to be I'm either a self that ha is, you know, fearful, or I'm no self. But but that's like, no, I'm awake consciousness that has these parts that some are very functional, some are not so functional, some are some have but there's a, the where you're aware from, which level of mind you're mindful from starts to be um the center, but it doesn't, as you say, eliminate or doesn't it gives you actually more capacity to be a sensitive human being. That's that's so um I love the clarity in that. In the sequence that you described, it's very intuitive and wise. And one of the things I think a lot of people want to know and want to trust, but have a hard time, is that that awake awareness is the truth of who I am, that these are parts, they don't define me. You know, I am not my fear. I am not my anger. And so it feels to me that a lot of spiritual practice is really about cultivating the the quality of attention, this accepting, compassionate, clear attention, relaxed attention that allows us to disentangle our identity from the part. And and I'll never forget at one point somebody shared uh, the story about a wise sage and people would bring their problems where they were most stuck, most small, most feeling like they were unworthy. And um, and he would swear them to silence, and he'd say, "I have just one question, and that is, what are you unwilling to feel?" And it seems so clear that it's our resistance to feeling life that keeps us identified with the small self. The small self is a a patterning of resistance to what is true right here and now. And you described very beautifully the way of, we have to pause. There are these patterns that keep us identified. So the sacred art of pausing, I mean, if we can just remember, just to pause for a moment, just that. Yeah, that's exactly right. Ah, uh, Because if we've paused, there's a little more space a little more re remembrance of presence that can allow us then to have the courage to feel what's here and the tenderness to feel what's here in a way that transforms not the thing 
but the sense of identification, which is the whole deal, as you know. And one of the things I'm finding so helpful is that even once there is a sense of resting in a larger presence, um, there's often these different thoughts and feelings that re-snag. And it becomes really helpful then to, you know, just, you know where is the self that's experiencing this? Um, what I've noticed is actually inviting ourselves to sense, okay, where is it living? You know, like finding a place and a felt sense that correlates with that familiar sense of a self that's owning experience, that's running experience, whatever, that if we can connect with that, it's possible then to just invite that sense of a self to relax in and as the awake awareness that's truly its home. But yeah. we have to see it. We have to catch it. It's like a ghost self. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> yeah. Because it's always trying to go one up on everything else. It's like, <clears throat> are you aware of your feeling? Yes, I am. Well, are you aware of the one that's aware? Yes. In fact, I'm mindful of that one. Oh, I see. And I call that often a transitional subject. Yeah. So, yeah. so it's it's not a transitional object like when you're you're trying to bond with and self soothe, but it keeps. So, as you said before, getting used to that home base that is actually everywhere, nowhere, and here, and is more of a awake presence, open-hearted field that is aware actually from within your body as much as all around and, and interconnected. So it's almost those, that's the home base. It isn't just this, sep this separate battery of a physical animal that is physically separate. And that's one of the keys is to recognize, no, I will always feel, in fact, it's important to feel separate physically from that tree or from as I'm driving a car. So there is a separate dualistic level of experience that is important and that this and feelings happen within there, but who they're happening to isn't a point of view. It's, it's, um, and that feeling at first to the current, you know, protective system or ego defenses is like, oh, wow, it's a little spaced out, or that's a little woo woo, or that's like, oh, there's no ground here. And, but if you stay there, it's like, what's the ground made of? Oh, it's made of space. And it's, but it's not just space, it's dancing. It's alive and it's, oh, and it's, not other. And that, <clears throat> that little pointing, I mean, that's been my interest is like, okay, if this is already here, <laughs> as, as is said in, you know, what you write in, and reference in radical acceptance and your teachings, and I do as well as kind of a unique premise that it's not, there is development and uh, training and but there also is more unlearning and untraining <laughs> in order to discover something that's already here, not something that's, and that, so, so giving some trust and courage and <clears throat> support to almost directly recognize this and then abide and then include, and the key to, to, to living from it is to you immediately have to include the triggers that will then come up and say, wait a minute, what are you doing? You're, you're going to, you know, you're not going to be able to function from here. Thank you for sharing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. What you're saying, uh, most of the liberating practice is undoing. Hmm. It's like having a clenched fist. And if you just bring awareness into the clenched fist, there's, you don't have to, there's no self that has to unclench. There's a natural, the muscles know how to do it. Awareness knows how to wake up. We you know, just need to pay attention. And I feel like the message for me behind what I'm listening to is that the more we get familiar with 
boundless awake awareness. You know, the more, it's like every time there's that glimpse, there is some place in us that knows that this is more true than any story or narrative ever. There's a, a resonance of truth. And the more glimpses, the more sense that not just I'm going to let go into awake awareness, but awake awareness is the, is what I am, um, that keeps calling us. And one of the things I've noticed in a lot of teachings is uh, you kind of referred to emptiness dancing, how there's just this living dynamic that there's a kind of dry emptiness where there's a sense of awake awareness, but it's it's very vast and it, it there's something really wonderful and yet there's no tenderness. And what feels crucial is, and you, you talked about this earlier, is that we sense the awareness that is in and through our bodies. And it means really living and feeling from the inside out, that awareness that's in and through our bodies and through and around in every direction. And that that is continuous space that's filled with the light of awareness. The whole, it's, it's whole. And then when something comes up, there's a natural tenderness in the response. It's like the Tibetans talk about the three qualities of awareness as being that openness and that wakefulness, that knowing, and a natural tender responsiveness. And we don't get that third quality unless we're really embodied, inhabiting it. So I feel like the more glimpses, and I want to name right here that I'm going to be the one to bring it up. Locke has a new app that is just wonderful. It's like, it's just wonderful. And it has all different pathways to glimpsing, you know, to really sensing the larger truth of what we are, whether it's, you know, a one minute practice or a longer practice. And so I just want to bow to you, Locke, because I know the amount of energy mm -hmm. and what it takes, you know, blood, sweat, and tears to create an app. And it's, it's really wonderful. Yeah. Thank you so much. Yeah. It's, it just felt like it's, it's the delivery system or the contact place that people need in the midst of a busy life. Um, and that because it is already here, um, they can do a glimpse and then what I call marinate, you know, for longer periods of time, instead of meditate, you just, Glimpse, recognize, realize, embody, feel open-hearted, and now turn off, put the phone away, you know, now. But you have, now you're, you're kind of given a short uh, pointing, and that's been my interest, like you, is how to bring this into contemporary forms uh, to translate not only the language from the cultures of contemplatives of all traditions, not just, you know, from Western traditions as well as Eastern traditions and psychological traditions and neuroscience traditions of, you know, freedom and joy and maturity as well, um, and give tools uh, that are experiential rather than just um, written um, supports. You know, this is um, something that I felt uh, would be a way to, to share, you know, with people so they could make it um, part of their lives, wherever they are. So, yeah, so it's, it's, it's fun. Yeah. And as you say that, <clears throat> so I think that, you know, and that's kind of how I set up like <laughs> the intro course is kind of like, um, <clears throat> natural calm is the first one, which is calm abiding shamatha, but different ways to do that. And then, uh, the second one is types of mindfulness, deliberate and effortless. And then uh, embodiment. Um, and then I introduce a kind of way of doing this called local awake awareness, which is a way to actually unhook and drop and have awareness know itself, both within and outside. And rather than efforting to do it or trying to imagine doing it or, and then embodiment and what, what I'm calling there awake loving flow, mm. which you and I have translated in 
12 different ways because we want to try to get at it somehow like open hearted awareness, you know, um, <clears throat> Ram Das called it loving awareness, you sometimes call it open hearted presence. So there's something there or heart mind. Yeah, those three kind of moves from, um, you know, being introduced to mindfulness and which it unfolds naturally through Theravada insight, or to point to the pure awake awareness, and then to point to the non-dual, uh, which in Buddhism, non-dual emphasis isn't just non-dual awareness, pure awareness, it's actually the awareness that is not other than the aliveness. So that's the embodiment. It's like, oh, they're not two. That there's what's called in, in the Mahamudra, same taste, or simultaneous mind. So this, and then what <clears throat> Thich Nhat Hanh so beautifully called interbeing. So that grounding, interbeing, interconnects us to everyone. And then the operating system, we don't have to go back to create a thinker and a doer um, in order to be a calmer version of our, our small selves. But this heart mind or open hearted awareness has that fullness or wholeness, as you say. And so one of the you know, glimpses is literally feeling how we're identified or attached to thought. And then, you know, it's like a small self riding a horse of our body, looking out of our eyes. And then this local awareness, which is identified or attached, but is made of this spacious awareness can unhook and kind of drop and know your jaw from within, your throat from within, and then feel completely embodied and then find this heart mind or heart space that becomes the center. It also drops to the dantian and to the legs and to the feet and to the ground as well, but <clears throat> kind of is connected from, and it's, you know, many people who this is a good match for, many, some glimpses don't work for everybody, but <clears throat> those who find it, it literally just like, ah, oh, I'm home. Like this is, this I've been trying so hard from here to get there by being here, so. It's it really resonates in a way. It's a it's a guide uh, to move from that smaller, more constricted identity to relax the clench, mm. and yet there's many different pathways that help us to relax the clench, and. Um, for for many people, the starting place is really feeling stuck in a small in a reactive small self. I, I often think of Ramdas, who said, "You know, I'm learning to treat my personality as a pet." You know, mm -hmm. it's and and you're right that when we're actually resting and knowing it's home, that that heart space, our personality actually the natural intelligence of the universe and the love of the universe actually moves through our personality. Yeah. It, it actually sh shifts, but there is that learning to trust who we really are. And as, as you know, one of the, um, one of the pathways that I, many people have found valuable, we've touched on it a few times is the rain practice, mm -hmm. but I just speak a little bit about it just because yeah. So many people, Locke, have told me that rain saved my life. Hmm. And I thought I'd share that um, yeah. what convinced me to write a book about rain, the, uh, my book, Radical Compassion, a, a guidebook uh, to rain, and now this new 20th anniversary edition of Radical Acceptance features it, um, because it wasn't there 20 years ago. Um, but people kept, have kept giving me that feedback. And I remember all oh, about... 12 years ago, uh, my own experience with rain, where my mom, who is 82, came down mm. to live with us. And I went into this part of the trance of unworthiness where mm. I was falling short on being really there for my mom, but I was also falling short on this book I was writing. You know, I just felt really trapped in that anxiety and guilt. And I remember one day I was right here in my office and she came in with a New Yorker uh, 
article to show me. I was actually working on a talk on loving kindness, and she and I didn't look up, you know. And so she just laid the article down uh, nearby and very graciously walked out. And I turned to look at her retreating figure, and I had this thought: I don't know how long I'm going to have her. And so I decided to take a pause and go sit down and practice RAIN. And the acronym stands for Recognize, Allow, Investigate, and Nurture. And so recognize, okay, there's just naming it, there's guilt, there's, you know, kind of fear, and there's anxiety. And, and you know, kind of you let in all all the parts that want to be there and then sensing what was most compelling was that that feeling of guilt, of letting her down. The A, allowing, means truly let life be as it is. Not try to fix it, get rid of it, judge it, anything. Just let it be. It's kind of like it's a wave in the ocean. It belongs. And I actually say to myself, this belongs. Mm. To not Just to undo resistance, you know. And then the I, investigate. You know, there's there's beliefs there. Um, you know, I'm failing her and causing injury, and I'm failing what most matters to me. And underneath that, this felt sense of a kind of clench in my chest that was squeezing and aching and and painful. Mm. And so I I kind of put my hand on my heart, and I often do this as part of investigating because it's so quick that we exit from our bodies, and just to keep keep there and really said, well, what do you need to that that guilty squeezing part? And it just needed to trust my goodness, you know, needed mm-hmm. to trust I loved her. And that was the compassion of just kind of from my own awake heart, sending that message of you love her, trust your goodness. And if I mm-hmm. said it enough rounds, which I did, it got very tender and sincere. And after those steps, it's, there's what I call after the rain. And after the rain is where we notice the presence that has mm-hmm. unfolded. You know, mm-hmm. there's a lot of undoing. And when there's an undoing of a clutch, the natural presence that's who we are unfolds itself. And I just felt this, that I was this field of, of tenderness and wakefulness. The reason I'm sharing is because I started noticing when I was with my mother, rather than guilt, I actually was showing up. Like I, I wasn't trying to figure out when we'd be done so I could come upstairs and get more work done. And she died maybe three years later. But I, and you know, I, I could still feel the sorrow of that. Mm. But I realized that rain saved my life moments mm-hmm. with my mom. And that, you know, that precious, just the way you described those pathways mm-hmm. of being with with as much awareness as possible, not mm-hmm. resisting, and then discovering that what unfolds is really who we are, is so liberating. Because then we get to, and I got to, live with her for more of the truth of my heart. So I, so I thought I'd just yeah. share a little <clears throat> bit about the power of RAIN, because it's so yes. similar to... Uh, the work you do with parts yes. and with recognizing the awareness that has mm-hmm. emerged and knowing that's our home. Yeah, beautiful. Yeah, I've always enjoyed that. I also, <clears throat> like you, I also I love playing with acronyms. I've I've also played, you know, I played with those those words. And just as you said this now, you said the after after the rain. I just thought, oh, rainbow, be open with. <laughs> oh my gosh, <laughs> let me write that down. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean. It's almost this kind of playful way of teaching. It's you know, playful, to have, but it's so important because most and, people... And it's simple. It's simple. Simply and people need that because when we... Summarizes You it. described so powerfully earlier yeah. what happens when we get a limbic hijack. You know, yep. the way stuff happens and then the, the frontal cortex kind of shuts down and then we're being run by the limbic sister, system. And when that happens, it's like the times we most need... Um, effortless mindfulness, it's not Mm. accessible. So having four steps that are simple and easy to remember, it's like that pause. It it gets us, it undoes the reactivity and allows us to remember Mm. who we are. Yeah. Yeah. And the, the, the investigate, you include both, you know, like head, body and heart in it. 
which I love because, you know, just the word seems to be more head, but you say, and then just know what it is, but then, you know, feel the felt sense and then, you know, listen to what it says, you know, so that really is a deep, a deep uh, investigation. That Thank you for naming that, mirroring yeah. that back, because I think of it almost as probably 90% somatic. Uh-huh. Yes. That yes investigates the most misunderstood step because so many right. people spiral into the kind of psychotherapy of the stories and yes, I should right. have and he didn't and know the beliefs that are there. It's helpful to say, you know, what am I believing right now? Because whenever we're suffering, <laughs> there's a belief that's keeping us identified. Mm -hmm. And to know that we can discover that belief, but we don't have to believe our beliefs. You know, we yeah. really don't have to believe our beliefs. They're as I think it was Sokni Rinpoche said, they're real, but they're not true. That's right. Real, but not true. No. Yeah. And so <laughs> to see the layers of beliefs, actually a portal back into the body. A lot of um, mindfulness teachings for years was, you know, get out of the head and come into your body. But in mm -hmm. a way, there was a bypass of stories yeah. that are part of the narrative, but they're actually a portal to what's stored in our body. And if we try to right. step away from the stories of being abandoned or being betrayed or whatever it is, it's harder to actually connect and be intimate with what's alive and locked in our bodies. Yes. Yeah, that's right. Because the, <clears throat> the protective parts of us that are strong and, and often the ones rejected, you know, are are protecting something that we care about, something that's that's deeply precious, you know. So so it's that, you know. So to to be curious toward them, and um, you know, even not even to transform negative emotions into positive. So even that transformational, you know, there's some levels of that that are helpful, but ultimately, the the meeting of them um, as <clears throat> you know, as, you know, the other eyes, ignorance and interconnected and, and, uh, innocent and, uh, interdependent, you know, so, so the, um, the sense that, uh, that, you know, that what is the saying that, you know, the reason, uh, you know, that being in a human body is the perfect vehicle for awakening because of the suffering. <laughs> so it gives us that. So, that it gives us that ability to see that it's not two, that that there isn't a problem uh, from love, and that doesn't mean we're not healing or we're we're ignoring or we're passive. That there is action um, and interaction. Um, that but but that uh, you know the the untying of the knot or the the um, the detoxing process, um, it, 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 for everyone goes at a different pace, and certainly with our colleagues, you know, bringing forth trauma these days with you know Gabor Mate and uh, you know the body keeps the score with uh, Bessel van der Kolk and others that it you know it's it's becoming so now the key is to bring to that is that the the small self or the ego cannot handle trauma. <laughs> it's no matter how smart or psychologically trained, the reason it it's repressed is because you know it's it's not it can't bear the unbearable. And so it's only by upgrading to forms of mindfulness and compassionate presence that isn't just an attitude or another part that's trying to be a polarized part that's just like, you know, I'm hurting. Well, I'll, you shouldn't be hurting. I, I feel compassion toward you, you know, like, okay. So who's compassionate toward those two parts? Oh, there we go. Yeah. I am right there with you that with that story of what are you unwilling to feel? There's an intelligence to being unwilling mm -hmm. to feel when it's trauma and there's not enough of that authentic resourcefulness, and mm -hmm. you're describing it as really living from a more full sense of presence, because it's, mm -hmm. it's the presence 
slash love Mm -hmm. that actually frees up the identity of a traumatized self. And sometimes it takes for for many people, because trauma is so much in the society, it's in so many of our bodies, it takes a lot of emphasis on the practices that just create safety and love, that really remind us of our belonging. And actually not going right into where the pain is, but really resourcing with ourselves and not alone. I mean, that's the power of um, connecting with others, whether it's a, a friend or a therapist or a healer, or we ha- now have uh, Cloud Sangha, which is a online community of mindful friends who, uh, just to explore this unfolding together, we need each other. It helps us realize that it's not so personal, which is some of the agony of it is feeling like this is happening to a separate self that's deficient, and this trauma means I'm really, really broken. And as soon as we, I'm able to say, wow, you know, I go to a very deep place of angst about such and such, it begins to heal because we enter that broader sphere that you were describing. But, but it takes some time of that resourcing mm-hmm. uh, yeah. to be ready and able. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Some, you know, the, that, um, the sensitive human beings are often the ones who come to meditation as well. So they often have the sensitivity. They're looking for a a sensitive, uh, cure and, and solve. Um, so that, you know, that, you know, gradual support and love and whatever works for different people. Um, but certainly the, you know, one of the things that can, you know, has been held somewhat is the belief that, well, the, you know, the direct introduction to awake awareness shouldn't be done until you are healed or it's an advanced practice. But often I've found that even working in outpatient clinics, you know, in Brooklyn and the Bronx, that, you know, at the right timing, people do have access, even if they've had trauma and haven't really? developed a strong ego. I'm so right there with you. Yep. Yeah. It's, um, this is not like a progression where what's always and already true, mm-hmm. you know, that loving awareness is, and we've all had glimpses, and mm-hmm. the more the better. It may be that when someone's really stuck, they can't follow a sequence that will enlarge them, that might be some of the traditional ways of disidentifying. One of the things I found more and more with people that I teach and work with is the power of prayer. You know, at times we're very stuck in that separateness. And it's John O'Donohue, that the poet and mystic, says that prayer is the bridge between longing and belonging. And we all have this longing to belong. It's just part of our DNA. And if we get really in touch with it, inhabit it in our body and feel the the sincerity of it, and out of that place, you know, reach out towards a larger truth, a larger love, the power of that longing connects us. It's like the longing is love uh, calling us home is the way I, way I think of it. And, and you said so beautifully before, suffering is awareness sending the message that we're stuck in something smaller than the truth. We're in that cocoon. And, and so prayer helps us to connect with a larger reality. And the beauty is it's one of those practices that begins in a dualistic frame of mind and dissolves the duality. And I, I practice enough myself that I can, with prayer, that, you know, I know how if I'm feeling really small or I'm kind of caught in being down on myself and I'll sense that prayer of, you know, please love me. Please may I feel mm. loved and held and belonging. And then the yearning actually opens me to, uh, there's a, one teacher put it, love is always loving you, that there's Mm -hmm. just love. And there's still a you for a little bit. But as we let in that love, you know, as we really let it just 
bathe us, we start discovering the awareness that is already inside and lit up and loving too. And then that sense of separateness from that loving awareness dissolves. So I really encourage people to Mm -hmm. um, experiment. It's all an experiment. When they're caught in separateness, the different ways to bridge to a very heart-experienced opening sense of belonging. Yes, beautiful. Yeah, I think you know it's a very kind thing of you to <clears throat> to bring that back in some ways because I think some of the secularization, yeah. uh, particularly of Buddhism more than even yoga or other Eastern traditions, is was to take out the religion and to make it more available for people who have actually had either you know traumatic religious experiences or were forced on them or. <clears throat> there were other reasons that it wasn't, you know, the best place, and they're looking for something that's uh, simple and soothing, and you know, working with their own consciousness. But prayer or reaching out to something greater um, is in all Buddhist traditions, and it's also um, in you know secular traditions like uh, recovery communities. You know, prayer and meditation. You know, just call it power greater than yourself, you know, like whatever that is, it's just not you, you know, (laughs) you know, and resource with the source, what's that? And, you know, say, you know, help or thank you, or just open to, you know, to nature and to the universe and to, but to not stay in and just meditate in and just try to, you know, do, do the work that doesn't open to the mystery and to something that is undefinable, but palpable once you find a way, and especially people who are devotional types of people, they, they need, they need that so that it doesn't, you know, because you and I make sure they don't do it to us because that's (laughs) the key. That's one of, one of my main things. If we are not playing guru here, it's like, you're the, it's within you and look look bigger or more in or more out and resource with community and but find yeah find that um you know that plugging in to something greater and you know whether it's talking or singing or dancing chanting yeah dancing yeah just feel that that's there's a a willing an openness to something you don't have to define and or, the beauty yeah. is as you open to it there is a natural space of wisdom that mm. reveals that there was no self there. You know, mm. It's like it, it is yeah. part of dissolving that identification. And I remember one teacher, it might have been Ramakrishna, but I can't remember, mm. said that if you can't get rid of that self-identity, then just dedicate it to love. To, mm. you know, dedicate. It's like if you can't get rid of the self-identity, then cultivate gratitude or devotion or prayer or being in nature and just feeling, oh, I love, this is, this is me, an expanded part of me. And that kind of uh, bridging then actually frees up the identification. So it's, it's yes. a very cool yeah. pathway from uh, dual to non-dual. Yeah. And it is that, you know, it is that, uh, you know, finding the love that's greater than you that is who you essentially are. Yes. So it is, there's the non-dual. There's yes. The, <laughs> so it's, and then you can actually say, then you can say, then you can feel, I am love. Oh, I don't need to get love. Love's already here because it's not love with a small L or a, a type of love, but it's, it's the love that you didn't, it's the unconditional love, the unconditioned love. Yeah. So you know, as you say that, I, I, I'm so <laughs> aware of that, for so many people, as soon as they touch into that more of that sense of freedom, there's a tendency to then move right on to the next thing. And neuroscience is such a, a support in this, talking about how for a realization to really stick, for it to be really deep and pervading, we need to actively install it, like spend 15 to 30 seconds, you know, just attending to, oh, this, the isness that's, you know, just 
learning to stay some, and that's what creates the familiarity. So whether it's through gratitude or through that bridging of of love or prayer, or whether it's through a guided glimpse that you do, mm-hmm. it's that intentional getting familiar, uh, getting curious. What What is this like? Uh, curiosity is, oh my gosh, you know, yeah. there's the twin twin pathways of curiosity, you know, loving the truth and loving love. <laughs> yeah, loving love. And we all have our, you know, we all have both and we yeah. sometimes lead with one or lead with the other. And I'll share with you, I was just with a very dear friend who's mm. probably got a week or two to live, maybe three, mm. mm-hmm. uh, Roland Griffiths, who's uh, uh, very known right. as a pioneer oh, yeah, in psychedelics. Sure. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. So we just, uh, <clears throat> I had the honor and privilege of about three and a half hours with him a few days ago. And here's this person who is on his way out and yet utterly curious about the whole pass passing. And it's like, there's unpleasantness going on. Just as you said, you don't have to get rid of the unpleasantness. It's just that his curiosity is keeps unlinking him to a larger space of gratitude and wakefulness and openness so that there's a, there's a profound quality of, of acceptance that's, um, you know, when, I, when I'm with him, there's a part of me saying, well, so what, what, are, what can I learn more about, you know, facing death close up? And wow, curiosity. <laughs> yeah, beautiful. Yeah, that's so amazing. His work is so important, I think, for so many people. And, you know, having also been with people who are passing, just walking in the room is, is such a sacred experience. Yeah. It's, it's, there's like a, you know, with most people, sometimes it can be very agitated, you know, but it's very, it's very full of something, you know, sometimes people are early on, you know, clinging, but others who have kind of started that process um, are opening. And, you know, I've spent some time even was fortunate with my mother four years ago, who had a stroke and then was in the hospital. And my wife and I just slept in the small one one person mm. hospital bed next to her mm. over the night and would just you know hold her hand and just mm. talk to her and then and then we were there with my brother and uh sister in law just talking and kind of laughing and 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 then Paige, my wife just said there and we looked over and she just took <gasps> took that final breath and and then we just all just gathered around her and just thanked her and prayed and and spent this time. So it's you know, and the thing is, she she lived a good life. She lived a full life. She that's all. You, you know, I mean, I feel like I don't know what would happen if tomorrow, but I feel like for me it's dessert now. It's like if it's if it's if it were time, I would hope, you know, like Roland, I could. Face it, because, you know, the now is so eternal. Yes. I, I mean, I don't, know, I don't know if that just sounds like a, hope that doesn't sound like a, like a, <clears throat> like a card, you know. <laughs> but it literally is like that's the yeah. preciousness of um, having been, yeah, in, in, you know, like you're saying, it's, a, you know, very great fortune to, to be with people at that time. Oh. You know, people talk about the birth of babies, but this is the other birth, of right? It is. And, <laughs> you know, this has been a year of it for me. And mm. I just keep noticing that as the body is passing, there's this transparency mm. that happens. Mm. And it's mm-hmm. much easier to sense the truth of what you said, that timeless mm. spirit that mm-hmm. is is living through and i tell myself you know as my body is doing its aging things that okay the yeah. body's going down but the awareness is waking yeah. up and yeah. it's a trade off you know but i'll right. i'll go for awareness you know yes, yes. and th- there's a, a great uh bhutanese saying that if you want to be happy contemplate death 5 times a day mm. 
and and, and I think it means the death of the moments as mm -hmm. much as anything else. Yeah. That the more we feel like, okay, you and I are together right now, and then mm -hmm. this particular encounter will pass. Mm -hmm. And sensing the comings and goings allows us to tap into the mystery that is utterly still and eternal and present. It, it's a gift. So yeah. it's, it is a beautiful training to tend towards death in that way. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm just kind of called back to something you were saying before. It's kind of bringing these together, what you would call the you know, the fullness of you. Samsara and nirvana would be one way to say it, but yeah. But uh, you know that that as we are had the great good fortune of stumbling into this um, gift of you know um, this world of meditation and consciousness and uh, and psychology and healing uh, <clears throat> that you know when we speak I just you know some people as you say like oh I don't feel that I don't. Want you know, I want that. I'm in pain. I would, you know, that's too hard. That's too difficult. I, it's like, that's, I was there too. You know, <laughs> that was, I'm still, you know, I still have certainly fullness of experience and, you know, bring it on. It, it goes through a detox process that there was, <clears throat> you know, I can remember just a couple of years ago, just sitting at a table with a friend and just starting to shake and, <laughs> and, and, and then feel all this fear and he was like what's going on i said oh it's nothing personal <laughs> and, and i was like That's what great. am i saying exactly <laughs> and, it, and then what i what i and then i said wait a minute what it is is it something's moving through something's shaking and baking here and i'm just sitting here with you letting it happen and it i'm not even tracking how early it is or <clears throat> whether it has something or how it got triggered I'm not sure but it's it's cl clearing through. And then there is, like you said about neuroscience, there's something about, um, they say that emotions in the neurons is what um, what takes experiences and embodies them. So that's why trauma or negative experiences get bound in the body. So the importance of bliss for me <laughs> is really important. Or, you know, bliss, you could say, is a form of love. You could say bliss, you could say joy, loving kindness. But that, you know, even relief, even like, ah. Oh. But letting that, letting that not be a, a passing, like, okay, that good, that was nice. Now let's go do something. But letting it, you know, 15 seconds, 30 seconds, uh, marinate, you know, marinate the body in open-hearted awareness, and let the bliss go, follow it back to the essential bliss or the unconditional love, which now it's become more, it's not like the passing bliss with a small b. I mean, it is in some ways, but it's like, sometimes I say it's like that most intense bliss in the body spread out thinly throughout the universe. Mm. <laughs> mm. It's kind of like just, and that, <clears throat> You know, not that everyone can experience that, but when there's moments, so again, it's like, that's why I call it glimpses. So a glimpse is not a meditation state. It's not a <clears throat> experience. It's not a positive experience, or it's actually a shift from the openness to be aware, have recognition of the awareness to realization that I am the awareness that's embodied and then it's recognizing itself. The glimpse is, oh, this new intelligence is aware of itself being here with whatever is happening. I'm not doing it. <laughs> mm, taking that with me, especially the part <laughs> of the bliss spreading out thinly through the universe. I'm going to go with that ride. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good. Thank but it you. does. It does get the. It it is the important because there is some kind of almost a little can be a Puritan quality to some some of the yeah. Buddhist yeah. practice. So it can be a little um you know, and there's there's a, a need, you know, just that from the overactiveness to okay, just sit still. Okay, well I want to get up, you know, like 
Okay, just sit a little, you know, there's a little discipline here, but then it's leading to freedom and dancing and joy. And we need to celebrate. I mean, Thich Nhat Hanh said that it's not enough to suffer. You know, you have to touch peace also, and that includes love, gratitude, joy, wonder. You know, we need it. It's part of who we are. It's, It's more that we have conditioning to focus on the negative, so we need to undo that conditioning by just what you're saying, attending to the sweetness. I'm really enjoying this lock. You know, I feel like we're both, we have, we both have developed our languages and our our ways of practice and they're very beautifully synergistic. So this has been a treat. Thank you. Yeah, this is is such a wonderful thing. And I can, you know, because I can, because they're synergistic, I can follow your language. You know, I'm like, oh yeah, I know what you mean. I think it's like this. Oh, that's good. Like, oh, that's not, I like that. You know, like it doesn't feel, it feels like the same thing coming around the diamond, like we're coming around the diamond in a different way, mm. you know? Mm. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Thank you. So it's wonderful. Good. Well, such a pleasure. And, um, <clears throat> you know, certainly now that, you know, we have a, may have a chance to uh, uh, meet, you know, uh, you know, in the near future and uh, glad to uh, have you in in my life and in our lives and in the lives of so many that, you know, having a colleague who's like minded and like hearted yeah, yeah. is, is such a gift. So I really thank you, honor you and all you do. It's a yeah. pleasure to walk together, dear. Yes. Bless you. <laughs>